Please rise for our opening hymn. The Lord be with you. You may be seated as we invite the choir to come forward for our opening anthem, Spirit Come Down. We want to thank all our ensembles this year. They've been doing a lot of hard work and leading us in worship, and we're excited to have the Kids Music Club join us in this opening song.
Well, what a wonderful way to begin our worship today. And we do welcome you to worship. We give thanks to God that he has brought you here today and pray his blessings upon you on this day that, that he has made for you. Special welcome to those visiting with us today. We're so grateful that you are here and pray God's blessings to you. Those listening by radio, we welcome you and also watching on HCVN. Uh, thanks for joining us for worship. Our radio broadcast today was given by Dennis and Sandy Langhow, and so we thank them for that gift to our outreach. And then the flowers you see behind the altar are from Scott and Vicki Powers in honor of their 40th wedding anniversary. So happy anniversary to the Powers, and uh, thank you for that gift to our worship. The flowers on the pedestal over here are from the funeral of Ray Kruger, um, which was just this last Friday. We thank the Krugers for that gift to worship as well. If you've not already done so, we do uh, invite you to grab that welcome pad located along the center aisle and sign it and send it down the row. It's just a helpful way for us to know who's here today. Well, why all the festivities? Because it is Pentecost Sunday today. It's the third major Christian festival day along with Christmas and Easter. Uh, today we celebrate how the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples with power and gave birth to the church. And uh, I gotta say, the place is looking good for Pentecost, isn't it? We, we dusted off this old uh, mobile and, and we got the red paraments up and you guys are looking good with your red, so way to go. Uh, but my favorite decoration today is this quilt you see right here uh, next to me. This was made by our kids' music club. That's right, they sing, they quilt. I mean, what, what don't they do? Um, and so way to go, kids. Uh, that is really uh, a good-looking quilt. We want to thank uh, Gladys Pilgrim and Bonnie Schmeling for helping them with that project. I don't know if you noticed, but the bells have a little extra shine and a little purer ring today. Uh, they were just cleaned and repaired recently. You can see some of those pictures in, in your bulletin there, but uh, we want to thank you for supporting the fundraisers, and even the one that included Scott and I getting a pie in the face, um, which helped to make that uh, cleaning possible. Well, as we finish off the program year today, uh, we have a lot of uh, thanksgiving to give. We want to thank our musicians and ensembles for leading us in worship throughout this year, our Sunday school teachers, confirmation guides, and volunteers for teaching our kids and our youth. And on their last day with us, we again thank our Flinterns for being a part of the faith family. By the way, this is the last day to leave them a note um, in, in those bags over by the donut table over there. So make sure you do that if you've not done that already. With the program year ending, it means it's time for outdoor worship. And uh, boy, the weather's been perfect for that. Hopefully it maintains that. Uh, join us at Library Square starting next week as we begin our summer schedule. Of course, we still have our 8 o'clock service here in the sanctuary, but the 1010 service will be out at the park, bring a lawn chair. Uh, of course, if there's uh, bad weather, we'll, we'll be back here. But uh, uh, should be a fun summer in the park. There's a lot of more things to read about in the bulletin, including the summer ministries, Vacation Bible School, uh, the prayer team that we talked about last week. There's a gardening day coming up, and today is our graduate recognition Sunday. We'll recognize the, the graduates at a special brunch for them, uh, and then at the 1010 Foundation service. So read about all of that and more on your own time. But as we continue with our worship, let's rise and greet one another with the peace of Christ. Baptized into the death of Christ, we live in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 
Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. First John declares that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, based on that promise, I invite you now, in a moment of silent reflection, to confess whatever sin or guilt is on your heart this day. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his only Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all of our sins. Therefore, as a member with you of the priesthood of all believers, but by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. You may be seated as our faith singers help us with the hymn of praise this morning. Jordan River is chilly and cold. It 
It chills the body, but not the soul. There ain't been one train upon his track. It runs to heaven and right back. Well, I think we all felt the spirit during that, and so let's join together in the prayer of the day. God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, as you sent upon the disciples the promised gift of the Holy Spirit, look upon your church and open our hearts to the power of the Spirit. Kindle in us the fire of your love and strengthen our lives for service in your kingdom. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. On this Pentecost Sunday, the first lesson is from the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. Ezekiel's vision of the dry bones reflected the despair of the Jewish exiles in Babylon, among whom he lived. Here God promises them that he has not abandoned them, but will bring them out of exile back to their homeland. Note how Ezekiel's proclamation stirs the bones into action, but only God's spirit brings them back to life. Reading from Ezekiel. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you. And you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded. And as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone, I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came to them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. 
The second lesson today is the dramatic account of the Holy Spirit's coming on Pentecost Day from Acts chapter 2. Watch and listen as that event is portrayed in this video. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem, and when they heard the loud noise, everyone came running. They were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages, and we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there, amazed and perplexed, what can this mean, they asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, They're just drunk, that's all. Then Peter stepped forward with the eleven other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen, listen carefully, all of you fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood, and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before that great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The word of the Lord. At this time, I invite the children to come forward for face seats. Good morning. I have a bag full of stuff to show you. So come on up and we can see what's in this bag. OK, so maybe you guys can help me figure out when I would need these things. OK, here's the first one. When would I need this? When do you, why would I wear this on my head? No idea. Yeah, you can just shout it out. Yeah, maybe I'm a, a Twins fan, or maybe I'm just going for a walk and want to shade my face from the sun. Um, what about this one? Yeah. Ooh, maybe I'm going to the jungle on safari. That would be really cool. Can you believe we just had these laying around the house? went to BBS a couple years ago. You might know what this one's from. Train conductor. I know, you've got to have the bandana. I forgot that at home, but <laughs> could be a train conductor. Um, what else? What else? Oh, this isn't quite a hat on my head, but... <laughs> yeah, if you want to be Spider-Man, save, save good people from bad guys. Mm. Oh, and this one. If I wanted to be like dressing up like a princess. Yep. <clears throat> Ooh, yeah, maybe it's somebody's birthday. And actually today, everyone, if you look around, is sort of dressed up for the birthday of the church. This is called Pentecost. Um, and you just heard the, the story on the video. But they actually didn't wear party hats on their heads. Did you see that? They didn't have party hats. They had something else. Um, if you heard the story, they were all together. Um, all Jesus' disciples were together waiting because he had already gone up to heaven. And he said, I'm going to send you the helper. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. 
And so while they were in the room, all of a sudden, they looked around. I made this one myself. I didn't have this around. <laughs> they had, what is on my head? Fire. Yeah, it looks like fire on my head. And that's how they knew that the Holy Spirit had come to all these people. Um, and here's a picture in our, one of our picture Bibles. It looks like they have fire coming from each of their heads. And the cool thing is, when the Holy Spirit was in them, they were able to do really cool things they couldn't normally do. And Peter and the disciples, they went out and they were able to speak in different languages. And Peter gave a really cool sermon that you kind of saw, where he summarized all the things that Jesus had done for the people, how he died on the cross and he rose again to save them. Um, and I really love what he says, too. He says... Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far, far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And I love that part, because when he says, all you who are far off, he's not just talking about people in the room. He's talking about, like, hundreds and thousands of years later, like us. So the promise is for us, and that's a really awesome thing, because there's a baptism today, and a lot of us were baptized, and when we have a baptism, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. So we have the Holy Spirit living in our hearts, too, and the Holy Spirit lets us do really awesome things to tell people about Jesus. Maybe it's, it's not doing an actual sermon, but maybe it is. Maybe you're called to be a pastor someday. Or maybe it's just to go talk to somebody who needs a friend. Maybe it's to invite them to church or VBS. But you, we, can go with the Holy Spirit to do really awesome things for God. Will you guys pray for me, or with me? Dear God, thank you for sending us the Holy Spirit. Thank you that you can live in our hearts and that you can lead us to do really awesome things, to share your love with people um, and spread your kingdom, um, spread the church. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Gospel for the day of Pentecost is from John chapters 15 and 16. Jesus said, When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. And yet none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer. About judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. And for this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Please 
be seated. Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, Pentecost Day has long been the poor cousin among the three major festivals of the church year. Part of that is due to when it comes on the church calendar. I mean, Christmas enlivens the dead of winter. And Easter coincides with the first signs of spring. But by the time Pentecost rolls around, we're often in summer mode and thinking more about Memorial Day and the 4th of July. But it's also harder for us to grasp the event of Pentecost. I mean, even young children can understand the poor baby lying in a manger. And even though we can't quite understand that Jesus' resurrection the power of death is all too real for us. And so the promise of Easter rings in our hearts. But where do the dramatic events of Pentecost connect with our lives or experience? In fact, that disconnect may explain why there are few, if any, traditions that surround Pentecost. It isn't a day when families gather together or we decorate our homes. There are few familiar songs and no holiday foods, and outside of the church, there's basically no evidence that Pentecost even exists. But while I get all of that, it's still really unfortunate. Because Pentecost was the necessary capstone to God's redemptive work in Jesus Christ. Only the outpouring of the Holy Spirit finally turned Jesus' fearful and oblivious disciples into bold apostles who could proclaim Christ crucified to the ends of the earth. It was the Holy Spirit who began to form Jesus' followers into the Christian church that could carry Christ's ministry forward in succeeding generations. The Holy Spirit made the risen Jesus present, not just in selected appearances, but wherever even two or three gather in his name. So that for us, too, Jesus isn't a remote historical figure, but our present and living Lord. And the Holy Spirit activates the means of grace in our lives to give us faith, free us from sin, and equip us for service. Even if, we, even if we aren't quite sure how to celebrate Pentecost, it's vital that it not just slip out of sight and out of mind. And yet that brings us right back around to all the uncertainty surrounding this important day. I mean, for example, the rush of the Holy Spirit that enabled those first apostles to speak the gospel in many languages was a unique, unrepeatable event. It was different from the ecstatic heavenly speech that St. Paul discussed in his letters and is called speaking in tongues to this day. I mean, so Pentecost is interesting to read about, but how does that unique event affect you or me? Or again, God's Spirit is active all over the Old Testament, although he isn't called the Holy Spirit in any Trinitarian sense. But in Genesis 1-1, the Spirit hovered over the void before God began to create. The Spirit fell on kings like Saul and David and inspired the prophets to declare, thus says the Lord. So what was actually all that new and different about the Holy Spirit showing up on Pentecost Day? And beyond that, the Gospel reading for next Sunday covers the rest of Peter's sermon on Pentecost. And we will hear that it's all about Jesus. 
with only a couple more oblique references to the Holy Spirit's coming. Well, my goodness, if the Spirit couldn't get top billing even on Pentecost Day, how are we supposed to celebrate His coming in any genuine or meaningful way? Well, ironically enough, that in itself is the place to start. For as crucial as Pentecost was in giving birth to the church, and as vital as the Holy Spirit is to the life of faith, He never wants to be the center of attention. The Spirit's chief role is to point to Jesus and to create and sustain faith in Him. I mean, the Holy Spirit functions something like the chief of staff for government or business leaders who works feverishly behind the scenes to enact their agenda while drawing as little attention to himself as possible. In other words, the only real way to understand the Holy Spirit and his work is to look and listen to Jesus instead. And one of the chief places where Jesus explains the Spirit's work is John 16, the source of today's Gospel text. There, too, the Spirit's work is all about Jesus, specifically proving the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit proves the world wrong about sin, Jesus said, because they do not believe in me. He had been rejected as the ultimate sinner, a blasphemer and a charlatan. But in fact, it was precisely the world's rejection of Christ that constituted the ultimate sin against God. The Holy Spirit proves the world wrong about righteousness, Jesus said, because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer. You see, the world declared that because Jesus died a cursed death on the cross, he had been condemned by God, forsaken by the very Father whom Jesus insisted repeatedly had sent him from heaven to earth. But on Easter, God the Father raised the crucified Jesus from the dead in glorious validation of his entire ministry. And 40 days later, Jesus ascended back to heaven to sit at the Father's right hand. And thirdly, the Holy Spirit proves the world wrong about judgment, Jesus said, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. That condemnation which sinners assumed God had inflicted on Jesus was actually imposed on Satan and all the forces of evil. God flipped the devil's apparent moment of victory as Jesus breathed his last on the cross and used it to crush him instead. So that, as that great Easter hymn proclaims, my Jesus rose triumphantly and Satan's arrows broken lie, destroyed hell's fiercest weapon. You see, Christ sent the Holy Spirit as promised on Pentecost Day in order to show you and me how all the contrary and contradictory elements of Jesus' life add up to our salvation. That his birth as a humble child constituted God's mighty invasion of this world. Why his declaration of the forgiveness of sin stirred up unbelief and violent anger. How his torturous cross served as his royal throne. And that his crushing crucifixion was, in fact, a total 
an eternal victory for all humankind. Apart from the Holy Spirit's power, we could never begin to perceive, much less trust, that, as St. Paul put it, God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. And yet all of that would still be incomplete without one more great promise of Pentecost that makes this day so very significant. A promise declared by Peter on that day and by Jesus previously in John 16. And that is the promise that Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to you. Each one of you to plant these amazing truths in your heart and to nourish them there <clears throat> with saving faith. Jesus said, when the spirit of truth comes, he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Because all that the Father has is mine. And for this reason I said, the spirit will take what is mine and declare it to you. And then, on Pentecost, Peter quoted from Joel to assure that the Spirit falls on all of God's people. I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. You see, the event of Pentecost was unique, but the coming of the Holy Spirit was not. Starting at your baptism, God has poured out the Holy Spirit to work salvation in your life and in mine. And that's why Jesus assured his skeptical disciples, I tell you, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. You know, if you've ever played or watched any tennis matches, you know that when the players are one point away from winning a game, they are said to have the advantage. And it's usually announced very simply as Advantage Smith or Advantage Jones indicating that the game is running in that player's favor. Well, the saving work of Jesus is no game, but he has granted us the advantage. The vital promise of Pentecost is that because Jesus sent and continues to send the Holy Spirit, all of life is advantage you. Salvation from sin and death is running in your favor. Indeed, inevitably so, for the final outcome of this match is already known. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And until that glorious day arrives, the Holy Spirit comes again and again and again to guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. And that means, come what may, it is by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, now and always, Advantage you. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>
I invite you to rise as we confess our Christian faith together using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we continue to worship God with our tithes and offerings and our thanks to the ringers of faith for the gift of special music.
As we come to the prayers of the church, there is one addition to what is printed on our blue insert. We pray for or Orvis Baumgart, who's having some health concerns. Let us pray. Almighty God, we confess that we too, all too often overlook and even ignore the Holy Spirit. And yet we give thanks that the Holy Spirit's power is not dependent on our understanding, but on your sending. So send your Holy Spirit among us, as you did among those disciples, and as you did in our baptism. By your Spirit, show us our sin, give us repentant hearts, and point us to Jesus. And then empower us for powerful witness to the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we thank you for pouring out your Holy Spirit upon Berkeley May Krause in the sacrament of holy baptism today. As you did with your disciples on that Pentecost day, so seal Berkeley with your spirit. Give her a bold and confident faith, and may she grow into a powerful witness of the gospel. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we thank you that you gave that same baptismal promise to Ray Kruger. And as he now rests with you and realizes those wonderful promises, comfort and bless Lucille and the rest of his family as they mourn his death. Send your spirit of peace upon them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, send your spirit among those that are sick, those that are struggling with grief or depression or anxiety. Lord, heal them by your Holy Spirit. Be especially with Orvis Baumgart, Lynette Christofferson, Pat May, and all those we name silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Lord God, we thank you for the wonderful program year at Faith Lutheran. Thank you for raising up faithful teachers and guides for our children and youth. Thank you for singers and ringers and musicians who make a joyful noise. Thank you for every class, every ministry, every relationship, and every blessing. We thank you especially for our Flinterns and their contributions to our family of faith. Bless them as they go off into their next adventure. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, Lord, we, we send, ask that you send your Holy Spirit upon our graduates as they celebrate this major milestone in their lives and prepare for whatever is in front of them. We pray that you would go with them and before them, strengthening them in faith and assuring them of your presence. Thank you for their parents and guardians for raising them to be the young men and women they are. May they always know that they have a church who loves them and a God who is always with them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, almighty God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abundant mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn, O oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing.
Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.